Hello, I'm Bill Curtis in Chicago. You might say the city started with a fire. The year was 1871 when Mrs. O'Leary's cow kicked over a candle and started a firestorm that swept through wood frame houses and buildings about 10 blocks south of here. It jumped the river and burned 24 blocks to the north. 15,000 buildings were destroyed, more than 300 dead. And to this day, not a single big fire burns here without someone asking if the great Chicago fire could happen again. Probably not. But instead of one fire, the city had 31,000 last year with 89 fatalities. In the firefighters' world, nothing has changed. And yet, everything has changed. Somewhere in the city, there's a battle about to begin. It's a battle in a war that will never end. A two-story frame house, fires covering the back porch, the families just coming out the front. Lieutenant Billy Nolan, Squad 5, trying to get everybody out. This is a military assault on an enemy. On the flank, an engine company tries to save the house next door. They've got two men on a two and a half inch line, creating a water curtain to stop the fire from jumping. But the main battle is in back. We look at it as, as a, a war. You treat it basically a, a, as a tactical situation where you're you're trying to surround it, push it back, and, and put it out before it can kill and before it can burn two or three houses down. Watch the power lines coming down. More firemen are working their way inside. They're looking for the seed of the fire. It appears to be up the stairs on the second floor. They'll have to get water on it fast. The fire has a head start. A truck company pulls hose through the living room. Everybody helps. This is called working inside, and the old timers say you're not doing your job unless your ears are burning. If you don't get there fast enough, you'll be outside looking at the foundation. Only one man can point the nozzle, but it takes a team of firemen to support that point position. If you get a hold of 61, ask them how they're doing on that second floor in that building on the north. It's still too hot to find the main blaze. <laughs> On the first floor, what looks like a demolition crew is an attempt to find any hidden fires. That means ripping windows out, paneling off the walls, ceilings down, holes in the roof. They're also ventilating. In a typical closed house, smoke and heat build up to extremely high temperatures. They have to let them out to get close to the flames. Tower 39 is pulling ceiling in the communication on the first floor. We have fire on the first floor on the north building. They call it chasing the red devil into walls and ceilings so the fire won't come back. They may think they're making progress. 
but what they can't see is a roaring blaze on the roof that's pushed three firemen back to the edge. This time, the enemy is very strong. distant column of smoke on Chicago's south side. Oh, Jay! Slap this roof a little bit. Pull this roof down. Put some water on there. Ladders are already on the roof. An engine company trying to ventilate the top floor was hit by a flashover. The heat and smoke built up inside and exploded over them. They'll push back in, but with some casualties. Their ears were exposed and were burned. Relief Lieutenant Art Kilday with second degree burns on his ears. This goes with the job. Some suggest incidents like this might be prevented with modern fireproof materials, but. Most of the firemen I know won't wear the Nomex hoods. Uh, because then you're completely covered. Your face is completely covered. You have nothing exposed to tell you that you're in too far, that it's too hot. I'd rather lose a few layers of skin off my ears and, and find out, uh, okay, I'm in too far, I'm getting burned. It's time to back off, regroup, and go in again. Squad 5 has regrouped. With the heat and smoke venting out the roof, an engine company is trying to get hoses up the stairs. Four 51 engine 60, so bring a line up to the second floor. We have a lot of wire up here. This battle is nearly over. At best, it's a draw. Basic firefighting hasn't changed, but there are new challenges for today's firemen. And they have added a deadly edge to a long tradition. It's Easter Sunday, 3 a.m. Taking the 211. Get in the 211. 35. Uh, we're in service and we're available. Uh, where do you want us? It's a liquor store with fire coming out the roof. It looks like arson. They have a stream going on the front door. This one's too dangerous to go inside. Surround and drown is the way to go. Tell this company to back off. It's gone anyway. Reach it going this way too, Terry, to your backside, will you? Terry, I need a big one. Go next, he wants to go next door. I need water! Careful, watch this power ladder. We always hit us a couple. Let this water shut down. 2253. Chief Billy Malone knows he has to get lots of water on this fire, front and back. But he also knows he has to get above it. He calls for the snorkel. Drop a line into the snorkel. Message received. 
273 to 84, did you get that message? Yeah, we got a drop line into the snorkel. Atta boy. Yeah, you're 20, squad five, squad five. Squad five, go. The snorkel was introduced by the Chicago Fire Department in 1958. It is now a standard tool around the world. Those are dangerous power lines they have to avoid, and that isn't easy. When the two four-inch lines unload, 600 gallons a minute pour out with a force to knock down walls. I was caught in a, in a building once when a snorkel went to work, and I got hit with the, the, the water and it slammed me through a, uh, a wall and started pushing you down the stairs. It's, it's a, a tremendous stream of water, and you can get seriously injured. So you just want to make sure and give everybody opportunity to get out of the way before you go to work. Three corners and a roof is in. Going your way. This is a scene unknown to the firefighters before 1958 and it's been an enormous help. But down there are new dangers. Somewhere in that terrible beauty are chemical cocktails they didn't even dream about years ago. Hazardous material, um, it's everywhere. Um, clandestine labs now. Uh, you know, there's explosive things in the, and they set them up in houses. Uh, it may be a normal bungalow house, you don't know, you got a little fire in there, you're thinking it's a, you know, a little fire, and it turns out to be a lab or something that with explosives in there. Terrorists. Um, new thing coming into the picture. Uh, what do you got there? Booby traps. We had a fireman hurt years ago where there was a bomb explosion. He was on the roof, saw a package, went to move it, and it blew up, and he lost his hand. Uh, so fear is the unknown. I get high volume. We're compounding our problems with the type of materials that we're building with. Our codes are changing dramatically every day. We're using plastics and PCV uh, uh, piping and plumbing that we never used before. Uh, the, you factor in all the different materials uh, that are adverse under heat, <clears throat> plus you take the uh, factor in the uh, human error, you're always going to have fire situation. And something else has changed. And I'm here to tell you, don't make no sense. Right now, that's all they're doing is about to shoot people. Don't make no sense. The big cities are experiencing the most violent period in history. There's now a handgun for every man, woman, and child in America. Which means every time a fireman enters a building. Gangbangers, you know, got the ammunition now, or anybody, even collecting weapons. Um, explosives, uh, veterans with hand grenades left over or something, uh, or just even a simple propane tank on a back porch, you know, will eliminate the entire back porch, if not whoever's in it. This child was not breathing. As paramedics worked to save him, anxious parents prayed for his life to come back. It did. This too has changed in the age of AIDS. You constantly have to be aware of um, AIDS or even hepatitis or any of those uh, illnesses. If you take the chance to do a mouth to mouth, you know, you, there's guys that'll do it and you get an infant or something and you're trying to carry them out, you'll take, you'll take that chance. You have to weigh the consequences yourself and it's a personal decision that nobody else can differ from you on it unless they're in that situation. 116X, whenever you're ready, send the water. Your driver's hurt already. Be careful. Back at the liquor store, they sort through the ashes. 654 to battalion 25. Fire Commissioner Raymond Orozco checks on an injured fireman. Fire is secured. Further instruction, 36654. When it cools enough to see inside, some surprises. On the shelves are only the cheaper brands of liquor. It looks like someone has removed the more expensive brands. Was it just a very good day of sales? Or had someone set the fire and couldn't resist the temptation of saving the better stuff? It's the kind of clue an arson investigator looks for. And in this case, it points right to the owner who torched his own store. The building was lost 
But since a fireman was injured and liquor was involved, the owner was prosecuted under federal law and is now doing time. In the gray dawn of an Easter morning, what's left is a ghostly skeleton. There were no fatalities, but every fire puts the firefighter dangerously close to harm. An apartment building's on fire at 311. The problem is the wind. It's blowing the flames across the alley and down the street onto cars. The neighborhood's been evacuated. Go ahead, 273. You want that power ladder to take the rear? Concentrate off. on this building. On this one here, pull this off. Yeah, get that power ladder up in the rear. Water. There it comes. Go ahead, you want to go next door? Okay, okay, okay. okay. Hey, Jimmy! Hey, Gallifold! Yeah! Where's that light? It's coming! Right here. Chief Francis Foley knows he can't get inside at this point, but he still has the fear, are there people inside? Did you find out if it's occupied? No. Oh. I'll try and find out. His strategy is to get as much water on it as he can. It's too tight for the snorkel. So his men have to drag lines front and back. The whole thing is uh, going through the roof now. The enemy is advancing, and the army is trying to counterattack. Hang on, you guys. Give me a line back here. Bring that line back here. Pull on that line. Get them some slack. Come on. 44, 44. The back wall of that building is out. Down. Don't go in. Don't go in. Okay, we've got all our engines committed. Let's take the second line off of Comte out there. 43, I want you out of there. Two men on a one and three quarter stream trying to cool a car. They may be able to hold the line if the winds cooperate. I got a perfect angle at it. Watch out, sorry. Keep it up on top. An engine company gets a point advantage from a neighbor's house. Without the snorkel, this is the next best thing. Heads up! Heads up! Yeah, but there's another frame right next to it, about half foot six inches away. Okay. No longer worried about people inside. Now Chief Foley has to worry about his firemen and women. He knows he'll lose the building. The fire is too hot. But can he save the block? Sometimes it just comes down to experience, knowing how to read a fire. And it can mean the difference between life and death. It was another fire like this one that Squad 5 remembers. Teams were making entry on the first floor. They were up on the roof ventilating. They ordered us to put the snorkel to work. We were in the basket, starting to go up. And, and we had just seen other guys from Squad 5 and other companies look over the edge of the roof. And next thing you know, the whole roof went in. When the roof went in, the wall came out. We had to bail out of the snorkel basket, slide down the boom, because the wall came down onto the snorkel. The, uh, there was like no indication for the guys on the roof. But fortunately, they had a well-experienced man from the squad up there who got up on the roof late, noticed that they had a lot of heat and a lot of smoke and no visible fire, and said, let's get off. As you can see the yellow smoke belling from the side, the eave, and the wall. So then I walked over and took a look at it. Then I could see she's pulling away like, and I know right away then, as long as the fire has been burning from the time that they call us, that the roof was no place for us to be at. And when I saw that, then I told all the guys to get off the roof, and get off right now, and they did. They all dove to the ladder to make it. They lost all equipment and everything. 
At the time, we didn't know they had made it. So we scrambled back up into the basket. They told us to get up there. It was just one big orange fire. The roof was gone. We thought they were all dead. You know, until 10 minutes later, we found out everyone had gotten out and they had made it to the ladder. But at that time, you're thinking, you know, you're, oh my God, you know, they're gone. And it can happen anytime. I guess it's just lucky that we got there because the guys won the roof, they would have been down. All of them would have been down. Because they, they, you know, none of them never went over and looked at it. You see, there are certain things, uh, and this, this also comes from uh, older firemen, good firemen. You, know, you watch them, and, and uh, if you have it, and you come from good truck offices, that teaches you these things, and you stick with them. That's how you pass it on to someone else. Uh, you help them. I had a brother that fell 10 stories down an elevator shaft and burned up after they got trapped in an elevator. These, he was rather young, but uh, the other firemen that died had, I think, approximately 20 years, and so did most of the men in the, in the companies that were there. Something they thought was routine turned into a disaster. Two firemen were dead. I think five or six others were injured. And that's one of those things that uh, you can think about in the back of your mind, uh, but you never see happening to yourself. By morning, things look a lot different at the apartment house. The fire struck out, but it will be several days before the firemen leave. There were no fatalities. The point advantage held, and the chief was able to contain the enemy from taking the neighborhood. What seemed an unstoppable inferno last night smolders between broken walls. When a cat gets stuck in a tree, we call the fire department. When there's a drowning, a plane crash, we call the fire department. Or a traffic accident. Squad 5 arrives to find a car that's hit a light pole. The driver is pinned in. You'll still see some of the all-time firefighters that will pull up on a scene and yank the door open, chop out the glass, and just pull the people out. We can do much more damage to a victim, especially if there's a neck or back injury, paralysis. Terry McChain uses the powerful jaws of life to take the roof off. They will literally disassemble the car around the driver. She does have a broken leg, but her screams may be as much from fright at the operations going on around her. Paramedics crawl into the car with her. The car was pretty demolished. Uh and the way that the lady was pinned in there, we took the roof off of the car and had to pull the steering wheel, steering column up so we can actually get her out. And uh, also we had to push the seat back because it was pretty well accordioned in. The squad managed to get a neck brace on before sliding the woman from under the steering column. The car had collapsed around her. It took a little time to get her out, and most people in the pinnons are really scared. So, uh, you know, with all the 
power tools going and, you know, 15 guys trying to work, taking parts of the car apart and everything. They get pretty anxious to get out of there. And when they're, they're moving and screaming like that, they, uh, you know, you got a little bit of time to get them out, but you want to get them out as quickly as possible. The woman recovered quickly from a broken leg thanks to advances in handling rescue operations. In this case, technology and education took precedence over experience to the benefit of an accident victim. If you hurry, you get too many people screaming around, you know, they want you to hurry and do something. They, and it looks like it takes you a long time to another person. But what you're doing is you're doing the best job you can and you know what you're doing. <laughs> One of the most unusual rescues for Squad 5 took place after police found the aftermath of a robbery. Gang members had entered a house, robbed a man, and then disposed of the evidence, him. Instead of killing him or tying him up, they stuffed him headfirst into an air duct leading down to the basement. He hung there all day until neighbors heard him yelling. Swing your right to Okay. Okay. Can we grab his legs? Pull the right. Pull it. Get out where you work on the thing. Hold on. Let's get the weight. Squad five had to open the duct like a can opener and then gently lower the man to the basement floor. We lay on the floor yet? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. We got room, man. Let's put it on the side. All right. Sit it just like that. Yeah. Have him slide off from his right here. It may seem strange and even humorous, but it could easily have been fatal. Yeah, well, he's probably all like, no, this hurts, right? No. No, let's fix it then. Just your back, right? It's not exactly saving a cat up a tree. In fact, they will never see another one quite like this. How does this feel? All oh, this feels good? Yeah. See that couple abrasions here? When it comes to rescue, more lives are saved by the air breathing device than any other. In the old days, a fireman was called leather lungs, having to breathe smoke in a house fire like this to get to somebody trapped inside. I can't see it. If a firefighter tries to breathe smoke today, it could be some toxic mixture of plastics and synthetics. Old-timers may still resist it, and those who are claustrophobic, but being able to breathe inside the smoke has been a dramatic advance. The one single piece of equipment that has changed the way fires are fought is that mask. and Because uh, it still takes water, it still takes axes and pipe balls, but uh, we can get in a lot faster and a lot closer to the fire and get it out a lot faster, thus preserving life, uh, rescue hazard there, and, and more property. Hey, Kevin, watch it go. And there's another tool made to order for urban firefighting. Sometimes they have to wrestle their way in. We pair off in twos. One of the forcible entry teams at the front or the rear will carry a, a shorter Halligan bar. And we've drilled quite often on driving the Halligan bar in uh, the, between the door jam and the bar and working it as a team, even if the fire's kind of coming out above your head or something, or it's real foggy. In apartment buildings, if you have a multi-unit uh, apartment building, each apartment often has burglar bars on the doors. So you're not only forcing one, you're gonna, you may be taking five or six. We've given the firemen new tools, but they are still overwhelmed by some of the challenges of the 20th century. In April 1986, a small squad of Russian firemen was the first on the scene at the Chernobyl nuclear reactor. They struggled to put out fires on the roof, having to work in deadly radiation. It wasn't long before they all died. All but one. Designated hero of the Soviet Union, Major Leonid Telyatnikov. 
I ask him, after he knew the radiation was high, why did he continue to fight the fire? If we didn't, who would have put the fire out? Besides the firemen, no one was there. Is it sheer courage that makes a good firefighter? Or something else? In, in my opinion, uh, aggressiveness, but also cautiousness. In my opinion, as soon as you think that you can't get hurt, you can get hurt. You constantly want to try to uh, monitor the situation yourself. How hot is it? You know, what's the smoke doing? Is it pushing? Is there pressure behind it? What color is it? How far down to the floor is it? How far down is the heat? You know, this is all going to tell you something through experience. And um, you have to keep this stuff in mind. Uh, so you want to be aggressive. But then again, you don't do anybody any good if you get yourself hurt. Firemen have a spirit in them to fight the battle. You, you push it. Uh, I think a pilot would call it pushing it to the end of the envelope. I think every one of us is very aggressive when it comes to fighting fires, as anything else we do. I, I think it's part of your attitude uh, of wanting to do the work. And ra I'd, I'd rather be working as would any one of the other five firemen that's sitting around the firehouse doing nothing. They've been called the last heroes. We ask the men of Squad 5 who they respect. Bruno's the senior man in the company. He, uh, good man. For his time on the job and his age, uh, it's pretty hard to, for a young guy even to keep up with him work-wise at fires or anything like that. His, uh, you know, most valuable asset is his knowledge of, of the buildings and when to get out of them and when to get off the roofs and everything like that. He's, you know, gotten off more roofs with Bruno saying, I think we should get off now. And uh, so sure enough, the roof goes, goes in or, you know, but uh, he's got a good sense about him with his, all his experience and everything like that. And he's just one of the guys that everybody looks up to him. Okay, now we got this one here. Let's put this one in its place. Lieutenant Shepard, uh, I work with him as a lieutenant and as a captain. Right, and he's one of the, one of the better firemen that I've seen in a long time. He tell you what tools to bring and that's what he wanted to do. And if he didn't do it, he would hear from him. He wouldn't make the mistake the once. And uh, he worked this as hard as, an, as a fireman would. He was just an outstanding officer. That, that's, to sum it up, that's, he, he was one of the greatest. Step on my back, right on my back, kid. Go ahead. OK, bro, let's pull him some slack. You're dealing with men that, that uh, are going to give you 120%, 150%. And you have to give them their head. You can't treat them like kids. Uh, when you get on the fire scene, uh, I have to know each, uh, as an officer, and, and that you're talking about a particular fire, uh, I have to know each one's talents, what their strong suits are. And you try to team them up. And, and I always try to work two guys together. Uh, I think from a safety factor, I think that doesn't need, need an explanation. And uh, I have been blessed all the time that I was a company officer that I, I was surrounded by some of the best men on or off the job. We see them as part of the landscape at modern disasters, cloaked in black, wearing protective helmets, seemingly impervious to our worst tragedies. For any fireman, it's saving a life that makes it all worthwhile. A mother makes it down a fire ladder. Inside the home, someone heard a young boy whimper as he hid under some rags. It may have saved his life. Get an ambulance! Huh? Get an ambulance! He takes a long trip to the ambulance. Uh, 
This young man is lucky. Captain Tommy Casey got to him in time. When fire rages, life can tick away in a matter of seconds. That's why getting inside is a race for life. Bring that light in this bedroom right here, guys. We got fire in the air. Up the stairs, struggling to get inside. There's a baby in there somewhere. We tried so hard to get up there, you know, and there was reports of children trapped up in that building. And we were able to make it all the way up to the particular bedroom that the baby was in, but there was so much fire that there was, we were unable to enter the room at all. And it was a matter of, to avoid any further risk to us, you know, getting burned, that we were had to extinguish this fire first before we were able to enter the room. Yeah. All right, let's back up, back up. Not yet. We saw that everything, the fire was in there. Everything is down. That's the room the fire started. Well, one of these two rooms is supposed to be baby, so we'll just... Okay. Baby or a baby? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 You got it? Okay. All right, we got it. We got it. Yeah, okay. As it turned out, the baby was severely burned, and he was obviously DOA on the scene, but it's hard, you know? Uh, it's just, that kind of thing stays with you for a while, too. I've seen some real horrible things, you know, and yeah, you just, you deal with it, I guess, you know? Uh, you just work that out somehow, you know, when you get home. But they do come back up. You know, it's good to talk about them, you know. It's good to talk about them with your family. Uh, it's good to talk about them with the guys at the firehouse the next day. All right, take it to the ambulance. Sit in the back? Okay, you the back? Okay. Any more? And so a small life lost. What happened? The baby was left alone with an uncle while the mother went to the store. The uncle left the crack burner on so he could pick up a delivery of crack at the front door. The ether spilled and started the fire. Chief? Louis? Miss Abaco? Yeah. Any more? No. Not, not so far. Okay. Outside, there's no fire anymore. It's almost calm, but the difficult moments have just begun. The friends and relatives slowly, painfully, will learn what happened. They want to see the baby, but the most humane thing is to refuse. We see the family in pain, distraught at the news of a child's death. We seldom see the firefighter's pain. I found five kids in a basement one time. We had a basement fire that was blowing out the front wind basement windows. We made entry into the back, and as we pushed forward, uh, I was with the nozzle man. And uh, that was it. He says, oh, that's it. I'm at the front. And I'm like, no, you know, we didn't go far enough because you constantly keep in mind building construction. You know, you're thinking, what direction am I traveling? Uh, how many feet have I gone, you know? And I ended up breaching the wall, in, in other words, going through the wall. Uh, and I found the five kids on the floor, a couple infants, and I think the oldest was 12. 
Uh, and then we just started handing them out. You know, we had the fire extinguished by then and that. Kids are probably the worst. You know, I have a little son at home and you, every, everybody has kids and they don't have a fighting chance. You know, so those, they're usually the worst. You want to save all lives, but especially young kids. And this, you know, you because they haven't lived the life, no life at all. And if you lose one of those, that'll stay with you for a long time. You, you see a lot of it, uh, but uh, sometimes kids uh, it makes you kind of choke up. Sometimes it's bad for an old person, old, older person, but uh, kids uh, are the worst. You don't want to see that. My own personal feelings are if I did the best that I possibly could and did everything that I think I could to save these people, then I, 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 I don't feel as bad that somebody expired. But also, how could I have done a better job? What, what could we have done different to save them? And yet what must be a fireman's lowest moment can also become the highest. Squad 5 was working a house fire. No one mentioned any children being inside. The fire was knocked down pretty quickly. Larry and I were doing a primary search toward the front of the building. It was a lot of smoke still. We're trying to ventilate as we were searching, and lo and behold, Larry found an infant, a two-year-old, just underneath these curtains up in the front room, underneath the couch, you know? And nobody said a word about the infant being there, you know? The baby turned out to have, to be in respiratory arrest. He wasn't breathing. So we just took the infant, we ran outside, and we started doing uh, resuscitation efforts on her, and turned out she was breathing and crying before the ambulance even got there. So, boy, that was the greatest feeling in the world, you know. Especially, you know, I have a two-year-old and Larry has two young kids, too. This is the second rescue like that we've made in about three years, where we were able to basically bring them back to life. You know, both times they were small kids, they weren't breathing at all, and we were able to get them breathing, and get them crying before the ambulance got there. And I tell you, it's, it's a great feeling. It really is. That's the most rewarding thing, I think, about this job. Uh, you don't come to work looking for fires or want something to happen because that's the tragedy every time you go out the store, you know? But to save a life, when you do that, then you can come back and you feel awfully proud to, to know that you that really did something that's worthwhile. Two one ten to sector three. Uh, battalion thirteen in sector three. Uh, what does it look like now, babe? Uh, we're winning. Hey, that's pretty good. Squad 5 is one small unit among the 4,000 men and women of the Chicago Fire Department, part of a long tradition of holding the line against a war that will never end. But the rules are changing for the modern fireman. Hazardous material, new diseases, and rising violence in America's cities. It may not be the great Chicago fire, but it requires just as much dedication every time the siren sounds.